delighted to have an Andy Warhol show, which originated with the Tate in London, England. And one of the ambitions about this show is to have a fresh look at Andy Warhol. There's a lot of mythology around Andy, a lot of which he created himself. And we wanted to dig in and really find out a little bit more biographical what really motivated him. So there are various themes in this exhibition. One is that he was an immigrant. His parents came from Slovakia, uh, from Eastern Europe, and he was born in Pittsburgh, grew up in quite a poor environment in Pittsburgh. So his immigrant status is one, one thing that we were interested in. The other is his religion. He was a Catholic. And he was a, you know, a, a, an Eastern Orthodox Catholic religion, so quite, uh, and he was Catholic all his life. Uh, religion was very important to him, and that's something that people don't really know. He was also gay, and he was gay at a time when necessarily it wasn't easy to be gay and be a Catholic. And he was gay in the States at a time when it wasn't necessarily easy at the beginning. And the other thing that we're really interested in is all his life he was obsessed with death. And you will find death popping up all through this exhibition. At the beginning of the exhibition, we have chosen to put this portrait Andy did of himself in 1967. And it's classic Andy, and it, it says a lot about what you'll see in the rest of the show. He, he used a photograph. Um, and he made several portraits from that same photograph. So you can see a very recognizable Andy Warhol, but then he's covered it up. He's, what he was trying to, de to do was to take away any sign of sort of humanity. He was trying to abstract himself, take the emotion out. And that's something he plays with, because whilst he's saying he's taking out any sort of sign of, of humanity, you can actually see up there where his hands have worked with the paint. Warhol was quite a sickly child, um, and when he was sick in bed, he started collecting photographs of celebrities. And his father died when he was about 12 or 13, but left money for Andy to go to art college. Went to art college, then he went to New York, where he worked as a commercial artist. So he was make drawing advertisements for magazines and newspapers and so on. But then, he, in New York, he earned quite a bit of money, bought himself a house on Lexington, but then he started wanting to join in the art world, to join in the fine art world, the art he was seeing in galleries. And he started making pop art. He started, uh, so you'll see over there the famous Campbell soup cans uh, that he was famous for. So the art that was going on at the time was there was um, abstract expressionism, there was minimalism, there were all sorts of fairly, you might say, elitist sort of art styles. And he injected something that was much more of the people. Um, so he was very fascinated by combining the sort of commercial art world he'd come from with the fine art world. And he also was fascinated completely by mass production. He used to say, an artist should be a machine. So you see he's repeated those Campbell soup cans. The story, by the way, with the Campbell soup cans and why he was so interested in them is that growing up poor, his mother used to actually literally make soup from water and salt and pepper. Or she would put ketchup in water and that would be tomato soup. So he never forgot his, his roots. So this is an image from 1962, and it's called 129 Die. It was the French crash, it was a French Boeing um, at the French airport on its way to the States. It was the hugest airplane crash at the time that had happened. And he started to become fascinated with death and disaster. And part of what I think is really interesting about Andy Warhol is that he is creating a psychological portrait of America. I feel as if, because he's got that sort of distant vision from you know, immigrant parents and slight objective vision. Uh, one thing that I love about this is it's literally, he's taken it from the newspaper, but he's done it by hand. So, you know, he's tried to make it look like newspaper, but it's all done by hand. 
But what I really love about this, because nothing is ever incidental in, in a painting by an artist like Warhol, is I love weather, fairly little change in temperature in the corner, the, the irony of that. And then the Statue of Liberty in the other, other corner, which for him, it was the Statue of Liberty was something he included a lot in his art. You know, the, the, the symbol of American democracy and so on, and his mother came in through Ellis Island, in, which is of course where the Statue of Liberty is, in 1921. So he's, we'll see later many comments on that particular image. But this was his first ever painting of death and disaster, and we will encounter that again in the exhibition. This is in a way a continuation of his obsession with death. This is Marilyn Monroe from 1962, and he made this image a month after she died from overdose. So it combines some of his fascinations. One of his fascinations was with celebrity. He did a lot of celebrity portraits. He also, on this idea of the artist as machine, so he is, it looks like a machine. He did this, by the way, from a film still of Marilyn in a film called Niagara from, I think it was 1953, I can't remember the date, but. Um, so he's used that film still, and he's repeated the image like a machine, but it's not, he isn't really being a machine. And if you look and you see the pencil lines, you see they're actually not, all completely regular. And then over this side, he's used color. And in fact, if you look at the orange of her and her hair, I mean, it's quite expressive. He was working on this in his house in Lexington. And one of his people who collected his art, a gallerist, saw these two pictures and suggested that he put the two together. Um, to me, this is called a diptych, you know, when you have two paintings together. But, I, you know, and I think it works very well. And, you know, she fades away. I mean, it's almost like you have, your, you have your moment in the sun, you have your moment of glory, and then you sort of, it, it fades away. Andy being Andy, um, now we are in, in the 60s, it's 1966, and he was surrounding himself with all sorts of characters. He created a studio in a place called The Factory, and the factory had all kinds of people there. It had, you know, actors, rock stars, drag queens, all kinds of people showing up at the factory. And again, on that idea of mass production, so he called his studio the factory. At a certain point in 1966, he decided he was going to retire from painting. He was not going to paint anymore. And so he had an exhibition with these silver clouds these floating rectangles, and they're, they're full of half air, half helium, so they don't float all the way up. We have to have these wires here, because they do try and escape. So he had an opening with these clouds, and people, of course, if it wasn't for COVID, we'd be in there bashing them about and, and so on. But his idea was that these represented paintings, they're rectangles, and that he was gonna liberate them and not paint anymore. And you know, he floated one out of the window and it, it went up. But of course, he kept painting. Uh, but one of the things he was reacting to was some of the art of the time, like Donald Judd and various other people who, I don't know if you know his work, but he did things like a, a stack of shelves. And that would be art, you know, that would be his art. So he's taking the mickey. He, he's, he's sort of imitating that and, and one-upping it. In 1968, Warhol was shot and actually died, he was resuscitated. He was going up in the elevator to his factory with various people in an elevator, including somebody called Valerie Solanas, who wrote the Scum Manifesto, which is the Society for Cutting Up Men. And I think she had given him a, a manuscript to read, she thought he'd lost it. Anyway, she had a gun with her, she shot him. And, and the bullet went right through all his organs except his heart. Interestingly, the chief curator then at the Art Gallery of Ontario, Mario Amari, was shot as well, and he survived as well. So after that, Warhol was never quite the same again. Um, it, you know, it was an awful experience. He had pain the rest of his life, and he became afraid. So 
his factory ceased to be the place that everybody could just walk in. And he moved on to making different kinds of art. So conspicuously, he's still painting. Um, so these paintings, um, an Italian gallerist commissioned him to make portraits of transvestites. Um, and so his friends went to a bar called the Gilded Grape in New York, which is where Warhol used to take his friends, and got some people, offered them a small amount of money to sit and, and be painted. And so here we have, I, I think these are quite exquisite. For me, this is one of the, the most beautiful parts of this whole exhibition. Um, there we have Marsha P. Johnson over there. Um, he was quite an activist, um, but it, it's a very interesting, it's a sort of moral question here though because he was painting these people, they had no agency over what happened to the art, their names were not originally on these paintings, but he, he, how Warhol used to, walk to work to make um, portraits is he had a big Polaroid big shot and he would take lots of pictures and then he'd pick which picture he wanted and he would use that. He would put that, silk screen it onto the canvas and then he would paint on top of that. So that's how he made all of these. So we have a question, you know, is it ethical that he did this? Um, it, it, it's an interesting thought. And, and because he is, of course, cisgendered, doing this, you know, how do we feel about it? I think if somebody did that today, there'd be a huge reaction. So. And we do have a question online, and I'm getting some quite feisty answers. This is Warhol in Canada. This is a portrait he did of Karen Kane in 1980. William Hector was a lawyer and a supporter of arts and film in Canada, and actually called Warhol at the factory and said, will you do a portrait of Karen Kane? Karen Kane, of course, was the prima ballerina for the National Ballet in Canada, later its artist artistic director. And so they flew to New York, at Karen and, and William Hector, and Warhol photographed with his big shot camera, and picked an image and made 200 silk screens that William Hector sold to support the National Ballet of Canada. So as I mentioned, Andy never got over being shot. And this, by the way, this is a series called Gun. He did also did a series of knife paintings. But this is the 22 caliber snub nose pistol that Valerie Solanis used to shoot him. We started with a self-portrait at the beginning of the exhibition and we were ending with the last self-portrait he did in 1986. He actually died in 1987 at age 58. And he's wearing here one of his fright wigs. He started going bald when he was quite young and started wearing toupees and then he moved into wigs. And he had them arranged in these bizarre fashions. And, and he became very recognizable in the nightclubs in New York in his, in his fright wig. But just looking at this bald face, um, he suffered pain ever since he was, he was shot and he also was very afraid of dying. In the end, he actually had his, it was his gallbladder that killed him, but I think his health was never the same. And I don't know if you want to end by looking at, at the actual wigs. We have several of his actual fright wigs in a case over there. Here I am in front of some of his celebrity portraits. He always did them to the same square formula. Uh, Mick Jagger, Dolly Parton. Um, I hope people will come and see this exhibition for themselves. Uh, Warhol is still influential. He is still, he was a very original thinker. I mean, what makes an artist sell for the price he sells? Um, it, it's originality. He really, if you think about this art, at the time he was making it, in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, it was radical. He, he was brave. He had a very fresh view, and he was a very intelligent um, analyst. He absorbed all sorts of in influences, and he very intelligently made comments, really, on the American life that he was living in. This exhibition is open until October the 19th.
and I hope you come and see it because there's nothing like standing in front of the original art yourself. <laughs>